Hello everyone, my name is John Blackstone. I made this video for anyone out there who might be suffering from depression or if you are a loved one or a friend or family member of someone who's suffering from depression. This is going to be the first in a series of videos that I'm going to make in my attempt to try and help people who are suffering under this terrible syndrome, this disease and this illness. My story is that I, a year and a half ago, I emerged out of an eight year period of major depressive disorder. Um, it was a brutal, torturous experience for me, as just as I know it is for many of you out there. And that's what these videos are. I made these videos basically because when I came out of it, I realized that I wanted to do something to help other people that are dealing with this because it, I found it so hard to find people that understood uh, what I was going through. The video that I'm going to show you right now is a compilation that I made. I watched hours and hours of television programs about about depression and when I was depressed I found that the most comforting things that I found um, were the were when I found people who were able to describe depression in a way that resonated with me personally um, because it's so hard to describe what depression is like. I made this video I put this video together there's a lot of descriptions, people who have suffered from depression that talk about what depression is like in their life, what kind of damage it did in their life. But the other side of it is it also includes a lot of testimonies from people who were loved ones of, of, of people who suffered from depression. And um, so I made it both for people who are depressed and for those who love someone who is depressed. And I, I really hope that it's an encouragement um, to many of you out there. Um, if you're interested in seeing my other videos, I'm going to start making them and putting them up on my YouTube channel. Um, and I hope that you will share this with anyone that you think might be helped by, by these videos. Thank you very much. I'll see you again soon. I want so much for simple things. Wellness. Happiness. Family togetherness. I wish I could answer why this is happening sometimes i really and truly feel like i'm going crazy and why when i am so surrounded with love do i feel so alone and right now no one can say that i haven't tried i have i'm scared if you think about the worst you have ever felt in your life and imagine feeling that way every day and not knowing why then you'll know what depression is you feel it as anguish in your chest you feel it in every one of your bones and ligaments you feel a heaviness and moving depression is a perplexing illness that takes many forms depression tortures you every day with the idea that you suffer and somehow I ought to be able to do something about it and I can't. Depression is an illness of loneliness and the primary experience is the feeling of being isolated, of being alone, of being cut off from everyone and everything. It can strike early in life or as late as our twilight years. Trauma, loss or neglect can lead to depression in those who are vulnerable. Our therapy becomes the bottle. Our therapy becomes pills. Our therapy becomes crime, violence. Genetics also plays a role. The major risk factor is having a family history of depression. I'm very anxious and very depressed because I don't think I can do this anymore. Treatment is an ongoing process of trial and error. If you can't talk it down, drug it down, shock it down, maybe you have to do something else in a much more bulleted kind of way, if you will. Scientists are hard at work, piecing together a better understanding of the many faces of depression. If someone can get the appropriate treatment and stay with it, the prognosis is actually very, very good. Meanwhile, over 20 million Americans are living with depressive disorders, many of them terrified to step out of the shadows and seek help. It is the gray cloud that comes over you and obscures all positive thought. You are living in a state that is not to you frequently worth it. You would, for that moment, prefer to be dead. 
it's a real illness and it's something that the person can't control when they are experiencing it. I call it the thief in the night. It comes in and so disables you that it renders you helpless and you really can't do much. And if you feel like you have nothing to live for, if you feel completely hopeless, then what's the point of getting out of bed? It's horrible. I mean, it's, it's like uh, somebody's dying in the family and uh, it's very hard on everyone. There were a lot of times when I said, I don't know how much more I can take, how much more of this, you know, can I bear? My name is Gina Stevens. I grew up as a figure skater. I'd say depression has ruled my life for five years of my life. I first remember being depressed when I was about 16 or 17 years old. My mom used to be really frustrated with my diagnosis. She used to think um, kind of this snap out of it attitude of, you know, why are you assuming this? Why are doctors telling you that? I mean, she would be angry about it or she wouldn't want to talk about it. I thought she was having um, a period that was difficult or uh, I don't know what I thought, but what I said was, for heaven's sakes, Gina, starch up your good Irish spine and, you know, life is a pendulum. It goes down, but it goes up the other side. So just get on with it. The person who has mental illness already feels shame. They already feel embarrassment. You're uncomfortable talking about it. There are times when I wish I did have something that, that was accepted in society, that people didn't look upon as so negative. Earlier in her life, she'd been a gymnast and uh, a swimmer. I, I met her on a swim team, and uh, she held a national record. She had been working in gymnastics and uh, attending Stanford University, had a very bright and uh, promising life and career, uh, except for the uh, depression. My depression started when I was 16, and that's when the sadness, the overwhelming sadness set in. She spent a lot of time in bed with the, the drapes drawn and uh, was pretty much in, incapacitated at that time. I would be unable to move and I would scream out of frustration into my pillow and, and cry because I couldn't function. You have no interest in life and not, nothing at all interests you. Your part of you is dying inside and there's nothing you can do and uh, it's horrible. Depression is such a, such a such an evil disease that it makes you feel like nothing matters anymore in your life. Oprah was on one day and she had a young man named Andrew Solomon, Solomon who wrote a book called The Noonday Demon. And as he began to describe what was going on in his life, every word was a description of a suffering girl that I had in my lack of knowledge invited to simply get over it. To this day, I, I regret it a great deal. For the first time, she actually realized that it was really an illness. It was just like having a physical illness, but it was a mental illness, and so she then became more helpful. She then became more understanding. She understands now that it's something that there's a biochemical imbalance in my brain and that I can't just stop taking my medicines. I can't just pretend like everything's okay and it's gonna go away. I'm Chuck Spielman. I was born in New York City. And I'm Amy Spielman. Uh, Chuck and I have been married for 40 years. We had three children. We now have two children. Our daughter Jenny died uh, five months ago. She suffered from some very serious depression. She would swing from being fairly normal to seriously, seriously clinically depressed. And she suffered for about 10 years. It came on when she was about 19. 
which is a time when serious mental illness does come on for people. We began to see signs that there was something there more serious than being a teenager, M much more serious, we thought, than the grumpy times that a teenager has when they adjust. And when we began to notice the gray shadows settling over Jenny, we thought about and got her into therapy. And we watched Jenny go from this vibrant, alive girl to spiraling down and down and down and down. We watched her go from the bed to out on the balcony to smoke a cigarette to back to bed. That was it. She couldn't, she just could not function. She feels like she's done nothing with her life. She said that she knows that we've suffered because of her. And she feels like she should get out of our house. She said that she feels like she's a burden to the family. Everything about her is about her being sick. I began to feel something that became more intense, which is that life was an endless uh, stream of events that held no hope. The eradication of hope. I consider myself to be the luckiest person I know. I adore my work. I have the most wonderful children. I'm a grandfather and that's unbelievable. And I don't care how fortunate you are to be surrounded by all the things that life can bring you. A depression can annihilate you. It is a demon. There is stigma, gigantic stigma. You have cancer, oh, how terrible. The phone rings off the hook. What can we do? Tell us what we can do. You have a mental problem, no one speaks of it. It's not heard of. Because there must be some nasty little secret here. It's a mental problem. People, they don't want to be around people that are depressed. A lot of times people are like, oh, you have depression? It's just, it's, it's, it's really hard. You know, it's like if I meet somebody new and we become friends, do I tell them that I have this disease? I mean, eventually they're going to find out. I recently had to give up my job as a physical therapist, an outpatient physical therapist, which I love. I love my job. I love helping other people because I can't do patient care anymore. My depression is too unstable and I'm too undependable. I started experiencing my first episodes of depression during medical school. All I could do was stay in bed. There were times when I didn't even get out of bed to, to go to the bathroom. And I didn't tell anybody at that time how depressed I was. I still managed to get through medical school. The one word that comes to my mind is hell, is I feel like I'm living in a prison in my mind. I feel like things are never going to get better. I feel like the hopelessness I have, uh, the sadness I have, the lack of motivation, the lack of direction are never going to change. That I'm always going to feel the way that I feel at this moment. And the only way for me to escape those emotional feelings of is really to sleep. And so that's why I sleep for such long periods of time, because it's the only way to get away from it. To sit and watch this fashion plate of a young woman in her night clothes for four days running, this immaculate girl not able to wash her face or comb her hair. It's too overwhelming to brush my teeth. You know, I, I think of that and I think that's crazy. I mean, what's so difficult about that? Or what's so difficult about changing my clothes or taking a shower? But it might as well be climbing Mount Everest. To watch her suffer is uh, unbearable. The toll that it takes on, on parents, you know, who love their child and all parents do, is, is very difficult. Jenny's depression was, the whole family was depressed. It's, it, it's pervasive. Everybody feels it. There was a period of years where 
my mom was constantly in bed, constantly in bed for two or three years. I just remember her never getting out of bed. Even during high school, I would be the child left with the teachers coming out going, is someone coming to get you? My daughter says that she felt that that was what all kids lived with, was a mother in bed, and she would be responsible for getting her brother up out of bed. He was two years younger than she. And she took on a role at the age of seven of being mother to Brent. There's this anguish that is so fierce that I, I, I equate it to being uh, to being on fire, the, the pain of burning alive, where it's just like you just want anything to happen for it to end, because it's just so awful. My depression started affecting every aspect of my life. I wasn't able to hold it together anymore. My needs weren't being met because it was all she could do to take care of herself. What situation would I say I'd rather be dead? Being tortured? Yeah. That's torture. This is torture. I was extremely suicidal. Because of my religious beliefs, I couldn't commit suicide because I believed that I would go to hell. I was hopeless. I didn't, couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. Couldn't maintain a relationship with, with friends. Lost all of my friendships. And I really felt like I was destined to just live in this painful, terrible place. So I prayed to God every single day to kill me. You really need, as my mom would say, you need to walk in the moccasins of somebody that's gone through clinical depression to understand what it does take to get out of bed. You're sick. It's like you've broken your leg and you're going to rehabilitation. Um, it's the same thing, although there's the stigma attached. And here we're trying to break that. It's like a black cloak. If you feel like your brain is crushed, all you want is to be on your own, isolated. Only someone who has had it knows how paralyzing depression can be. You don't even want to go to the toilet. You don't want to make yourself food. Never mind looking in the mirror to see what your appearance is like. No one is immune. You just get to a point where you just think, you know what, I'm just, I'm too much of a burden. It's so terrifying and you are in an absolute inner turmoil of, dis of despair. For the past 20 years, Cahill has battled with chronic depression. If and when I'm told I've got a, an incurable condition, sometime later on in life, I'll accept it better. But it will be nothing compared to the death that I've lived the whole of my life. Every day I have went through death with this depression. It is extraordinary that thousands of us in Northern Ireland will suffer from depression, and yet so many people will feel the need to hide it. Why? Because of the stigma. People with depression are judged to be weak. Some people even go so far as to think it does not exist. Like many people with serious depression, Heather reached a stage where she didn't think she could take any more. It was her thoughts of her family that kept her going. You just get to a point where you just think, you know what, I'm just, I'm too much of a burden. And I think you get to the point where you nearly do think that it'd be easier for them. And you know, looking back now, I know that it definitely would not have been easier. Um, and it was definitely the wrong thing for me to think. Denise Welch, star of Coronation Street and Loose Women, has decided she is not going to hide the illness she has suffered from for most of her life. Can you describe what depression does to you? Or what words would you put to it? It's so terribly frightening. If someone came to the door and said, you've won 23 million on the National Lottery, or they said, your family have been wiped out in an aircraft disaster, it'd be like that. Nothing. You are void of feeling and emotion. And that is the most horrible thing for someone who loves their family as much as I do. And if you lose that and think you won't get better, you'll probably end up killing yourself. And I used to use thought of suicide as a comfort blanket. What do you mean? If I don't get better, 
I can always kill myself and everyone will be better off without me because I'm not ever going to be able to live like this. I can't live like this. 23 years ago, when her son Matthew was born, depression struck out of the blue. I remember looking at the sterilising bottles and my mum, she'd say, go and get the bottles ready. It's four hours, he's ready for his feed. And it was like someone had said to me, there's Everest, go and climb it now. That's how it felt to get off the settee and go and do the bottles. It was getting harder and harder for Denise to cover up her illness. She was a big star. I don't like Dougie asking you to do things that he's too scared to do himself. But was hiding a big so secret. People out on the street then? She was leading a dangerous double life when she was filming Coronation Street. If he wanted it, Dougie could have gone and got it. People just didn't have a clue what was really going on behind the scenes. The police don't look too kindly on people who demand money with menaces. I was self-medicating. I was using drugs. I got myself into some terrible situations. I was working on drugs. I was a mess, physically, emotional wreck. I was driving to get drugs at three o'clock in the morning. And you crashed big time, didn't you? Mm. Because you had the profile, the drink, the drugs. It was a, was it self-destruct because of depression? Well, all I, all I thought about was, I need respite from this feeling. If alcohol numbs it for a bit, if cocaine numbs it for a bit, that's what I'm doing. Denise talks openly because she's sick and tired of those people who say depression isn't a serious illness. I went to see a GP in London and I'd never seen this GP before. So I'm so depressed. My mum takes me down there to get some help. And she said to me, oh, well, you see, dear, I had five children, now I just didn't have time to get depressed. That's what she said to me. That's a common reaction to depression. How does it make you feel when you hear them say it that? It makes me feel very angry. They've never had it. I'm all right, Jack. But oh, pull your socks up and get on with it. Because they, those are the two standard phrases that'll snap out of it, pull yourself together. When people do say that to you, it puts an awful pressure on you. Because you can't, do, you can't actually do it. And when you can't, it's like a failure as well. So I think it makes you worse. Well, it made me worse. Nobody wants to feel depressed. Do you think I want to feel if I could pull myself together? Of course I would. But it's, it's so deep in your head, Stephen, you can't. And I can't pull myself together like a pair of curtains. But depression is that severe. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It is an illness. Depression is an illness. I've worked as a psychiatrist for 30 years and I have sadly have looked after people where depression has been the fundamental cause of them taking their own life. I've also seen people who have come into hospital severely malnourished, who have been lying in their bed neglecting themselves. It exists. I've seen it for 30 years. Trust me, it exists. It's severe. It's life-threatening. Denise knows how tough depression is. But she also knows you don't have to let it beat you. There's, a, there's a, a philosophy that some people have that it's a form of weakness. You're weak if you get it. If you get through it, you're fucking strong, let me tell you. You are strong to get through it. Andrew Solomon became an expert and best-selling author on the subject of depression after enduring several debilitating episodes of major depression that started in his 30s. I always say that the opposite of depression is not happiness, but vitality. And that depression has to do with finding all of life totally overwhelming. It's a poverty of the English language that we only have that one word, depression, that's used to describe how a little kid feels when it rains on the day of his baseball game. And it's also used to describe why people spend their lives in mental hospitals and end up killing themselves. But clinical depression really has to do with the feeling that you can't do anything, that everything is unbelievably difficult, that life is completely terrifying, and a feeling of this free-floating despair, which is overpowering and, and horrifying. It's like you know, the Dementors in Harry Potter, how they kind of suck all the happiness out of you. They suck all your good memories. 
It's like the world goes cold. When we're talking about clinical depression, we mean depression that goes on for several weeks, in which the symptoms happen almost every single day. So what are these symptoms? There's feeling sad and blue, feeling guilty, feeling hopeless and helpless, having problems of sleeping and eating, and feeling life is just not worth living. And think, how can a man like that want to kill himself? You are, in effect, out of your mind when, you're, when you are in a depression. You, to ask, how can somebody have accomplishments? How can somebody who's a decent human being, how can he or she, how can they get involved in feeling this way? You know, and it's impossible. You've got it all, so well, stop feeling sorry for yourself. It's as if you're sitting with a whole somebody you don't know, somebody that's not interested in you. Uh, it's like being made to sit on the Greyhound bus with somebody that you couldn't care less about because it's not the person you know. It's just somebody else. And it's all, you almost go through a grieving process of losing the person you love uh, because they've turned into somebody else now and they're not the person you loved. And you don't know what's, what's happening. They're gone, but they're standing there. But they're gone. I mean, even you can understand it and have read every book about it and discussed it a thousand times, and it still doesn't matter. It's just downhill. All, it's in the air. It's in a whole thing around. A person, a depressed person, brings it with them. It's like coming in with a black cloud over your head. So everything just goes down. That's it. That's true. I was probably born with some sign in me somewhere that says, I'm ready to be depressed. Um, depression is, is uh, in my family like cancer and heart disease are in other people's families. And then I got suicidal. Um, I was not actively suicidal, meaning I didn't buy the gun yet. Um, but I was haunted and obsessed with thoughts of suicide for um, 23 out of 24 hours of the day. And it was a constant shift between the face of my daughter and pills or guns. The face of my daughter, pills or guns, you know, it's just, and it was just this flash, 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 flash. To want to die in such a strong way is the ultimate, is the ultimate uh, cruelty of a depression that is unrelenting. I'll never forget when you're sitting on the bed just sort of saying, you know, I just, mm. I just don't know if I can do this. And having, asking me to, to hold your pills, I mean, that, that was awful. I, I just sort of think of that period of time as automatic pilot and just doing what needed to be done and had to be done because it just, it was just running, feeling like I was running into a wall, a glass wall. You were on the other side, mm -hmm. but, you know, but there was just no way of reaching you. There, there was no escape. It was all awful and it was a prison, but the prison was in me. It just felt like it was in my house. I had a tremendous sense of failing as a mother. It, it registered later what damage had been done in my marriage. I don't blame myself for it, um, but I was most acutely aware of how unavailable I was to my daughter with whom I had always just had such a close relationship. And all of a sudden, tucking her into bed was so hard and listening to her long-winded stories was impossible. And I forgot the names of her new friends and just things that I put me, as far as I was concerned, in the bad mother category. I had just entered a new school and was making all these new friends and, you know, had this really, all of a sudden, really busy, you know, newly teenage social life. So I had stuff that kept me occupied and I was out of the house a lot. But, you know, it was still there when you come home. When you live with someone who's depressed and you remember a time when they weren't, you just sort of say, you, you think that they can stop. I mean, you know in your heart of hearts that they can't, but sometimes you just get so frustrated and you just want to say, snap out of it. And, and a lot of people, you know, who have friends and relatives who are depressed, that's a, it's a common feeling. And not only do you feel 
frustrated, but at the same time you feel horrible because you know that there's nothing that they can do to snap out of it. Any magic and joy that you had in your life, any hope for your future, uh, any sense of yourself as energetic or quick or bright or funny, all of those things go to a place and you cannot, for the life of you, get them back no matter how hard you try, how much people love you, or how much they try to help you. It's the most frustrating thing I've ever known. So I think it's a, a temporary death of the soul. I think one can say that in, in severe depression, the entire uh, body and, and, and spirit of a person is, is in a state of shipwreck of absolute desolate lostness. Uh, nothing uh, animates the body or the spirit. It's a, it's a total wipeout. People who have not experienced this illness at its worst, at, at its extreme, are unable to perceive, uh, as I was unable to perceive before I experienced this, that depression in, in, in its gravest manifestation creates a psychic pain that is every bit as painful as an exquisite, any kind of excruciating physical pain you can think of. You want out, and the only way out is death. And that's why people in extremis kill themselves when they are suffering from severe clinical depression. Though a great deal of depression involves irrational thinking, there are many moments when your, your mind is quite clear and quite objective, and I saw on Rose's face a look of such misery and suffering of several months into this uh, siege of mine that I began to see that she was exhausted and suffering too. It was so baffling, and I went through so many emotions after bafflement, um, resentment, because I had no idea he was going into a depression, and I thought all these symptoms were um, that he was angry with me and didn't want to do all the things that we had planned, whether they were trips or dinners or, you know, staying at home and having a cozy night, whatever it was, he withdrew. Uh, from me and just said adamantly no to anything that I wanted to do. So that was the beginning of, for me, of um, feeling that things were not right between us and that they were never going to be. The currency with which I once communicated with him disappeared and you sort of no longer know how to make contact. Um, and. I think at first the reaction was the frustration became such that you just give up until the point at which I think we all realized that it was not something in his control, that he wasn't just um, didn't have time for us. He, he truly um, was in some kind of state that none of us could identify immediately. Well, when bafflement and concern um, and uh, resentment don't come up with any solutions, then it uh, resolves itself into horror, in sort of a permanent state of horror of what is happening to him, what is happening to us, uh, what's going to happen between him and me, him and the children, and is he going to go down the tubes permanently, and this, will this be the end of it? or the horror of um, having to send him somewhere permanently. That was his great horror, that he would go into uh, a mental institution and never come out and die there. It breaks open the whole family. Um, and there was a certain amount of discomfort, certainly, and, and, and pain that went along with that, with all of us having to own up to a lot of stuff that comes out when one person is suffering. His face had sort of completely fallen and sunken. His eyes retreated. There was no light in his eyes at all. He'd lost a lot of weight. Um, he was 
really at that point incapable of sort of doing anything except holding your hand and saying, you know, I love you and I'm sorry. On the purely mundane level, to say I'm going to the hospital for a mental illness, we are, most people even today when there's some enlightenment about illness, a mental illness, are loath to accept the fact that they are uh, mad. It's, it's been ingrained in people from the time they're born in our society that there's something creepy and horrible about mental illness uh, and something almost immoral about it. So you, you tend to resist furiously the idea of going to the hospital. I didn't want to go to the hospital. It wasn't so much the stigma, I was just frightened of, of going to a, a, a place that I knew was a mental institution. But it turned out, in my case, to be my salvation. Because seven weeks later, um, after going to the hospital, I, I had emerged uh, feeling uh, uh, well and alive again. It is something uh, I, I, I cannot conceive of ever going through it again. And I think most people who suffer this feel the same way. But having suffered it, uh, it was a revelation. It was a revelation about how fragile the human mind is. After all, we have to remember that millions and millions of people go through this same torment. It's not an isolated, rare event. And with that in mind, uh, I realized that it, if anything, it enlarged my vision of human possibilities. Uh, it made me aware of the depth of suffering that human beings uh, can endure. I was very frustrated with myself that I couldn't get myself out. But at the end, when I was thinking of suicide, I didn't want to kill myself. I wanted to spare myself any more of this agony. It really wasn't because I hated myself. It was because on some level I loved myself um, and knew that if I was sentenced to an attorney of this, I, I, I wasn't strong enough, I couldn't take it. You do love yourself. You, you, you love, I mean, you've, 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 ever since you were born, your ego has been your constant companion and your ego has said this life has value. Uh, so you, you are left with a ex excruciating love for yourself, but it's a love uh, which is ultimately um, uh, uh, obliterated by the desire to get rid of this pain. Are you less of a person? No, no, no. I mean, there are parts of me that have just been through hell and probably look really battered up, but um, I'm more of a person. Look, this is now 12 years after the first episode. I wound up with three episodes. I've never felt better. Here I am, 78 years old, never felt better in my life for a 78 year old all you can say is what you can what you can say is hang on hang in there find the psychiatrist find somebody who will give you the the pharmacology that is necessary to help nine out of ten people can be helped nine out of ten people can be helped But what about the one million patients who suffer from what is known as treatment resistant or refractory depression for whom nothing works? Then what? At age 36, Deanna Benjamin Cole fell into a numbing depression. She could no longer function at work and withdrew from her husband and three young children. She spent most of the next four years inside this mental hospital in Canada. At times, it was a very safe place to be that I wouldn't have been safe somewhere else. Every possible medical and therapeutic treatment had failed, including 80 electroshock treatments. It got to the point where I thought everybody would be better off without me because then they wouldn't have to go through the pain of of seeing me feel the way I was feeling 
and that's a really, really, really scary place to be. But one last thread of hope was offered. Working at the frontier of brain research, neurologist Dr. Helen Mayberg had recently made an astonishing discovery with the aid of brain imaging. Mayberg already knew that every depressed patient's brain looked different. There seemed to be no consistent pattern among them. She also knew that most patients showed a decrease in activity in the frontal lobe, the brain's command center. But she noticed in the scans of patients who had recovered from depression, a tiny unmapped region of the brain called Area 25 showed a consistent decrease in activity from a previously elevated state. What you could see across the various imaging studies, at least to my mind looking at the data, was what had to happen to get well across all of these very different kinds of treatment was turning down that activity in Area 25. Area 25 sits at a critical intersection in the brain with pivotal connections to other regions involved in mood, sleep, motivation, and drive. This brain area is like it's at the core of all things. It's sitting in a place that when it goes wrong, havoc is wreaked. When patients recovered, Dr. Mayberg noticed that not only did Area 25's activity cool off, but the frontal cortex's activity picked up. The decrease in 25 tracked with the increase in frontal cortex. It's like they were linked. And this was one of our earliest clues about thinking about a system rather than any one brain area in isolation. In an effort to pinpoint where moods occur in the brain, Dr. Mayberg conducted an experiment. She asked healthy volunteers to ponder sad thoughts. What she found was that the same system lit up. Area 25 became overactive, while the frontal cortex quieted down. But while healthy volunteers could bounce back quickly from their sad state, depressed patients could not. And I always say, the machinery is in a state. The software is in a bad loop. This is emotion stuck. This is sadness, unbreakable. I think this idea of... To Dr. Mayberg, the illness of depression was looking like a circuit board failure. So she decided to surgically target Area 25 in patients like Deanna with the hope of resetting the brain's rhythm. If you can't talk it down, drug it down, shock it down, maybe you have to do something else in a much more precise, much more bulleted kind of way, if you will. There you've got a really kind of picture-perfect view on the left side. That is the spot. Adapting a technique from the treatment of Parkinson's disease called deep brain stimulation, Dr. Mayberg's team is today treating a patient in a clinical trial at Emory University. Right. Just kind of register how you're feeling right now and all those things, and if anything changes, you let me know. Threading two electrodes into the brain, the doctors plan to stimulate Area 25 with a steady low dose of electricity from a pulse generator, similar in concept to a pacemaker. Ready? Go. You are fast again. Are you actually aware that your speed has been changing? What, what's going In many patients, subtle but clear changes, including improved motor skills, are immediately noticed in the operating room. Have you been having this sensation at different settings where there's a change in the apparent? Occasionally, I have noticed that the room gets lighter. Uh -huh. um, it's almost instantaneously lighter, but not not instantaneously darker. Uh -huh. Deanna also experienced immediate changes in the operating room. I was looking at Dr. Maber and all of a sudden I felt that connection that I hadn't felt in over four years. Okay, let's hear it. okay, this... It's as if the brain has been jump-started back to life, then allowing patients to do the hard work of reclaiming their lives. The surgery was one of the obviously best things, you know, best outcomes. But it doesn't change who I am innately. It doesn't make me a more happy person. It, it just helped fight through the depression. Like many heart patients, Deanna now lives with a pulse generator implanted in her chest. But as she explains to people who ask, it does more than just stimulate her brain. I will say that, oh, it's a pacemaker. Um, to help my brain function properly, not my heart. Um, but I guess in a way it does help your heart too because it makes your heart feel 
treatment. To date, more than 55% of patients participating in this highly experimental treatment have experienced a dramatic improvement in their symptoms. Helen gave me that chance to, to live again, to, to, be, to be me. And that is a real, real gift.